Welcome to The Prairie Files, a true crime podcast. Disclaimer. Please note, trigger warning. This podcast contains graphic depictions of gruesome violence that may be alarming to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. But I'm glad she got life. That's all I can say right now. It just makes it a little bit easier, but not much. First was only convicted of manslaughter. The judge believed she had a change of heart and left before the actual killing. She could have been out on day parole this August. But last month, the Supreme Court disagreed and upgraded her conviction to first-degree murder. Because if she was making progress as much as they said she was, I would have seen tears in her eyes or remorse, but I didn't see that again today. Trial gets underway in Edmonton today against two men accused of sexually assaulting and killing a 13-year-old girl. I guess the the point here is whether or not he had uh, adequate access to a lawyer, is that right? That's right, Uh, and I I watched some of the videotape last week and it's, uh, it's, I mean, it really is bizarre, some of the the parts in it, I mean, goes into detail uh, regarding what happened and it is very chilling, I mean, uh, for anybody who has a child, uh, children go to the mall all the time and for these people to, you know, allegedly just pick somebody at random and then uh, go on to uh, uh, do what happened, uh, it is uh, quite scary. Welcome. To episode 6 Nina Louise on the Prayer Files a true crime podcast West Edmonton Mall located in Edmonton Alberta Canada is a magnificent and dreamy place that represents the modern perils of hard work and capitalism a water park ice hockey rink and various attractions spoil the onlookers as all walks of society intermingle. Sounds of laughter and excitement ring true through the air of the 800 store, five million square foot indoor city. The hum of the world's largest indoor roller coaster. The Mindbender can also be heard just down the hall from North America's largest indoor lake that houses a replica of the Santa Maria. Beyond the exotic animal exhibits, mini golf courses, and even a shooting range lurks a dark underworld that most overlook as they stroll through the hallways and the corridors indulging in unhealthy spending habits. They're oblivious to the terrors and the heartache that surround them. In the early 90s and into the early 2000s, it was much worse at West Hampton Mall. Kidnappings, sudden deaths, nightclub brawls, murders, and even organized crime would touch the mall. But with the increase in social programs, better mall management, technology, increased security and policing, the mall has become much less of a safe haven for the homeless and criminal activity. In the early 2000s, they were still trying to figure it out, and homeless children were living in the back hallways and the so-called underground tunnels that connect the stores to loading docks and service elevators. Youth and other homeless were also living in secure areas of the mall, somehow able to avoid detection from security doing their rounds. Now there are cameras covering every inch of that mall, but back then there was not. In many cases, the mall dwellers worked or knew someone who had worked at some point in the stores and therefore had keys and would invite others into secure areas of the mall. Many of these kids were labeled as mall rats, and some of these so-called mall rats would spend the day eluding mall security while stealing from stores or dining and dashing to survive and ease their hunger pangs. Some would go home while others had no home. You can find more information online about the sad underworld of West Edmonton Mall. Our story is just sadly one of many where West Edmonton Mall would be the venue for tragedy. This is the story of 13-year-old Nita Cordapat. It's a story of street youth being manipulated, running wild. It's a story of betrayal deception, 
and if all sources are correct, acts of possible jealousy. This story also includes deeply disturbing, psychopathic human beings entrenched in a world of drugs, sexual deviance, and even satanic sacrifice. All of the accused in this story lied and made up their own story. Although Nina was not homeless, she was introduced to predators who were evil to the core. According to the story about Nina in the Native Women's Association of Canada, Nina was born October 3, 1991 in Edmonton. A happy and curious child, cute smile and energetic, Nina was a popular and social girl. She made friends very fast. Nina was sometimes outspoken, but had a good heart and wore her heart on her sleeve. Daughter of Pisha and Tim, and the fourth of six siblings, Nina was very protective of her younger brother and sister. She would not let any harm come to them. As a child, she liked to tell them stories, would dress them up using makeup and nail polish. When she was older, she liked to make pancakes and eggs for her whole family on weekends, and everyone would say she was just a great kid. Nina had a very special relationship with her older brother, Patrick. She dreamed of being an actress and a model. She was involved in the Boys and Girls Club of Edmonton and other local clubs. Nina even won a modeling contest in Edmonton at only 13, which opened the door to future professional opportunities. Nina had a strong but kind side to her. She did her best to support and encourage classmates who were being picked on, telling them that they were beautiful and that they had inner strength. She was not afraid to challenge people, that's for sure. If she thought a teacher was wrong, she would stand up and refuse to sit down until they acknowledged their mistake. It seemed like she was always respectful, though. Nina's mom remembers watching to her surprise as Nina would scold a stranger. She caught smoking next to a no-smoking sign. When Nina was eight, the family moved to the Dunluce area in North Edmonton, which no offense to anyone who's living there, but I know the area, and it can be a little bit rough to grow up there. Pisha recounts, a series of bad experiences that occurred during their time there. It started when Nina realized she could scare the shit out of her mother by hiding outside after dark. The behavior escalated. Not understanding the significance or consequences of her words, Nina began to tell people that she was being abused. Isha and her husband tried to address Nina's behavior, but it was too late and child and family services were called. Nina was never removed from the home as the child welfare workers never found any proof to the allegations of any abuse, and it turned out she was just making this up. The media in this case gave the family a lot of flack at the beginning, which I think is just terrible. The family later moved to the west end of Edmonton, and after Pisha says that Nina was much happier, her behavior really improved. However, this would not turn out to be a good move as being so close to the big mall meant trouble for Nina. On March 30th, 2005, Nina told her mom that she was having a sleepover at her friend Crystal's. That would happen on Wednesday and Thursday night. Crystal was an older girl, 19 I believe at the time, and she was mentoring Nina through the Boys and Girls Club. I thought it was a little bit strange at first that there would be sleepovers in this arrangement, and it was a Wednesday school night but things have changed, and I don't know the entire story or circumstances, so I'm not going to make any assumptions. The plan was then Nina was going to end up having a sleepover at her best friend's house after school on Friday for the entire weekend. Nina's friend, KB, whose name is protected, would also tell the same story to her mom about staying at Nina's for the weekend. This was not an uncommon thing for the girls to do, as they were inseparable. Pisha notes that Nina, like many youth, tried to challenge the rules, but this was the norm. However, she also emphasized that Nina always called home when she was supposed to and always came home when she said she was going to, so her mother trusted her wholeheartedly. It seemed like there was a pretty good family dynamic there. However, later we would learn that this was not the case for Nina's friend, who we refer to as KB, as it was common for that friend to run away for days on end. On April 2nd, 13-year-old Nina and her friend, a 15-year-old, who the court calls KB, were at the mall doing their thing. 
while jumping back and forth from the arcade in McDonald's by Galaxyland, according to surveillance cameras, 21-year-old Joseph Laboucan and Stephanie Bird, 17, who was also friends with KB, approached them with an invitation to go to a bush party. The two girls were pumped and ecstatic and agreed to come with them. When you're at this age, it's an exciting time to go to a bush party. Laboucan then told them to stay put while he drops off his friends before returning to get the girls. Earlier that day, Joseph Laboucan kept talking about needing a girl to rape and murder, and it would be a sacrifice to Satan. He told numerous people he wanted to kill someone for fun and even chop off their heads. While the girls were waiting for Joseph, an Edmonton police officer came up to them to make sure they were okay, and they insisted they were just waiting for friends, not knowing their future would be grim. Once Labucan arrived back to pick them up, the four of them left the mall at around 12.30 a.m., now April 3rd. 2005. Video footage at the mall confirms this as well as testimony from KB. You could see all four walking out, Labucan slightly behind them. In the parking lot, they met with three other individuals. Michael Brisco, 34, a creepy guy hanging out with kids who probably were using him for his wheels. Michael Williams, 17, whose name initially wasn't released because of a publication ban as he was a youth. His nickname was Pyro, and also present was a 16-year-old girl named Buffy, whose name was never released. She got the name from the 1990s TV show, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, with Sarah Michelle Gellar. Buffy was quite the character. She had her teeth shaved down into a point, and she drank blood from her boyfriends, apparently. 13-year-old Nina did not know anyone other than KB, but they decided to go with the group anyways, because they promised a pretty sweet party. Others would be invited before Nia and KB, but they declined the offer, which also affected some people. The driver and boyfriend to Stephanie Bird, Michael Briscoe, pulled out of one of West Edmonton Mall's massive parking lots and started to drive west out of the city to Spruce Grove. Apparently at this point, nobody but Briscoe knew where exactly they were going, but Labucan had previous plans and they knew exactly what they were going to do. Later, it was said he just wanted to find a quiet place in the woods. While on the drive, some of the kids started to make out in the back seat, including one of the adults, Joseph Labugan, who was kissing with Nina. Stephanie saw this and became angry in the front seat. It wasn't enough that Nina had landed a modeling contract, but now she was stealing her ex-boyfriend. Witnesses would say Stephanie didn't really like Nina. She was quite jealous of the pretty girl, and in her mind, some sort of a love triangle was forming. As the wheels continued to turn, Buffy and Pyro were also making out in the back seat. The car went about 20 kilometers, where they ended up at the Edmonton Springs Golf Course, which was closed for the season. When they arrived at the golf course, the trunk on Briscoe's 1991 Ford Temple popped, and Stephanie Bird and Joseph Labacan quickly got out and grabbed a couple shiny items in the trunk, hiding them up their sleeves as they started walking towards the dark woods. The others would follow except for older Briscoe, who didn't want to see his girlfriend smoke meth, so he initially stayed back saying, go do what you gotta do. While walking towards the dark trees, Nina and her friend wondered, why are there no cars, people, or music? Is there even really a party? Nina asked. This is when Stephanie Bird, out of nowhere, strike Nina in the back of the head with a large wrench, as they also talked about weird satanic rituals. Nina freaked, stunned and confused, ran to Labacan, the boy she just shared a backseat makeout session with, who she thought would protect her. Instead, he whispered something into her ear, which would make her scream even more. He most likely said something about killing her, sacrificing her, or her being the chosen one tonight. Something along those lines. Extremely disturbing. Earlier, the group had spoken about this in great detail before picking up the girls. Nina then apparently freaked even more and tried to get away. But she was screaming, No, no, please don't, please don't. 
His grip was tighter than hers. This is apparently when Briscoe showed up with a flashlight and a belt in his hand. He apparently softly told her to be quiet, shut up, just chill, and she would be okay. He said he didn't want to make her be quiet. Ina's friend KB was in shock as Stephanie Bird quickly pulled her towards the car, telling her she didn't need to see this. As she walked towards the car, she could hear Nina's cries for help, which I'm sure will haunt her to this day. The others, I'm not too sure about. Stephanie Bird and KB sat in the car for about 10 to 15 minutes waiting for the others to return. Meanwhile, on the fairway of the golf course, more screams would be muffled in the cool air. I warn you, these extreme graphic and gruesome details of a child's death will be revealed. Extreme trigger warning. Joseph Labakan, along with Pyro and Buffy, would continue to beat her with their bare fists and feet. Joseph and Pyro then took turns raping the poor girl. Buffy would hold down Nina's hands and put her foot on her stomach so she couldn't move as the rape continued. Everyone else just watched like cowards, including the 36-year-old Michael Briscoe, who most likely could have overpowered them and stopped the vicious attack. I believe the sicko watched it and enjoyed it. I'm almost certain. Once the sexual assault was over, Labokan told her that she must die. It was the only way, and she was the chosen one. Nina then made a heartbreaking plea to her attackers to be stabbed instead as this would be a quicker and less painful death. They then tried numerous things to try and kill Nina, none of which worked. Joseph tried to choke her from behind with a wrench while Buffy would stand on her stomach and tried slashing her throat with dull throwing knives she kept around her own neck as a necklace. Labakan apparently tried to do the same with the knives. The throat wouldn't cut, but they slashed her face up really bad. They were unable to kill her, so they ended up using a claw hammer to strike her numerous times. Pyro, Joseph, and Buffy, taking turns, would hit her numerous times. This finally did the trick, and Pyro made an attempt to try and burn her or just burn her clothes. Pyro admitted that it would be a good idea to hit her in the groin area to try and hide any evidence of the sexual assault. We'll talk about this a little later when we discuss the autopsy report. Once she stopped moving or making gurgling sounds, as Buffy would testify, they returned to the car and told KB that they had only stripped her, beaten her, and sent her home. They also kept saying to her, if she ever says anything, she will be killed and dumped in a ditch. The whole group then went to a BP's restaurant and had a meal before dropping Pyro off. At some point, after eating, they cruised around White Ave looking for someone else to kill. They had a subject in mind, but they couldn't find her. They then returned to Michael Briscoe's hotel, where they would allegedly hold KB for almost a week. During this time, Joseph and Michael would show KB a pinky finger that was in a plastic bag in the freezer. They would tell her, this is what happens when you were the chosen one. KB seemed to have many chances to escape or get help, but chose not to. In court, she didn't have an answer as to why, only quote, I don't know. Seemed a little suspect, but without being in that situation, it's impossible to know what someone would do under this type of stress, so I don't hold any judgment on any of that. On April 4th, the owner of the Edmonton Springs Golf Course, along with his groundskeepers, were making their rounds, getting the fairways and greens into shape for the upcoming busy golf season. This is when he spotted something on the fairway that didn't seem real. When he approached the fourth fairway, he found the mutilated body of a young girl. This sent him directly into shock. He had to call his daughter to make the 911 call. As he was still in shock, completely distraught, he couldn't even remember the address of his own golf course. Initial media reports placed the girl's age between 14 and 15, but Stony Plain and Spruce Grove RCMP were unable to say if she was indigenous or Hispanic. Due to the severity of her beating, 
it was gruesome for the first responders, especially for those who had children themselves. Project Care was called despite authorities not knowing if the woman was a sex trade worker. Project Care is a special task force looking into about 80 cases of missing and murdered women living in high-risk lifestyles. Media release pictures of her clothing would tell a gruesome story of what happened. They also were hoping people could identify the girl through the pictures of her clothes. A couple days had passed after the killing and KB's mom ended up contacting Nina's mom after she hadn't heard from KB and this is when Nina's mom became very worried. They both realized the girls said contradicting stories about sleeping over at one another's houses. As a parent, I could understand this type of panic, but KB's mom pacified Picha and would tell her that her daughter does this from time to time and eventually will come back. This was all before the family had found out about a body being found, as they didn't watch the news or pay attention to the radio. Another day passed. Stephanie Bird and KB boldly ended up going back to West Empton Mall together to continue their mall rat behavior. This is where the story gets a little dicey, as it's hearsay, and I'm going off of unconfirmed third-party sources from news, websites, and other media posts on the internet. At the mall, Nina's mom Pisha and Nina's friend Crystal would search for Nina, while at the same time KB's mother was there also searching for her daughter, and would actually end up finding KB in the food court. At this point, KB's mother had found out about Nina from the news and thought the worst about her own daughter as they were supposed to be having a sleepover together. She was so ecstatic when she found her daughter was alive. She didn't want to let her go. She told KB that Nina was found dead and showed her daughter the pictures of Nina's clothes that were photographed and shared with the media in an attempt to ID her. KB broke down sobbing, but after a few minutes, still insisted on staying with Stephanie Bird at the mall and didn't want to say anything about what she knew or that she was there when it happened. It wasn't until her mother got a security guard or some accounts say a police officer had to cuff her to get her daughter out of the mall. Something had a real hold of her daughter. Was it Stephanie and the threats made by Joseph and possibly others? Most likely. Another source, that being the native trailblazers, mentioned that Crystal had actually found KB at the mall. When KB ran from her, Crystal caught up to her to try and find out what was going on. KB told Crystal that she had been kidnapped and she would be killed if she didn't go back to her captors. I'll back up just a moment here. Just before KB being found at the mall, Isha hesitated to call police after she was missing because they had run-ins before with social services and they didn't really want to blemish the file and cause other problems, which I could totally understand. But when Pisha's family found out about the body found on the golf course and saw the clothing that matched Nina's, they called police immediately. Within hours, they were able to make a positive ID. It was Nina. Pisha's poor daughter had been taken from her, and her life was now empty and would never be the same. The chief medical examiner, Dr. Graham Dowling, did the gruesome autopsy report. I warn you, this is a trigger warning. This is extremely brutal and sad to hear. Dowling said he performed the autopsy two days after Nina's body was found and described the girl as five foot three inches tall and weighing about 112 pounds. Quote, she was quite small and had a slight build, he testified. Nina's skull had caved in from receiving up to 15 head blows from a heavy object. Quote, there was one area on the right side of the skull measuring four inches across that was caved and pushed in. Her brain was damaged with skull bone exposed. Her lower jaw was broken and teeth were knocked out of alignment. In addition, her face was covered in lacerations. If I look at the totality of the injuries and look at the injuries to the right side of the head and brain, I don't believe it would be a survivable injury, Dowling said. This individual died as a result of head injuries, blunt cranial trauma, Dowling said. Once the totality of these injuries occurred, she would be unconscious immediately. The death would have occurred within minutes. Earlier testimony from several witnesses said Nina was struck in the groin area with the hammer, but this was unlikely 
as no injuries in the area were found. The likelihood of finding injuries would be very high, he said. The entire length of her body had bruises, contusions, and abrasions. He also found bruising and marks on Nina's hands and forearms. This would be consistent with defensive injuries, he testified. More disturbing description was given. Dowling said he also found shallow stab wounds on the lower side of her jaw and two cuts on the neck that were superficial as they barely pierced the skin. Dr. Dowling would later tell media the same things as he told the court and emphasized she would have died a quick death once hit with the hammer. He also was quoted as saying, the nature of this young woman's injuries was such that I don't believe they would have been survivable, probably in spite of the best medical care we could have given her. DNA was taken from her clothing as well as internally, which would be used to match suspects at a later time. Two male DNA samples were found, one being Pryros, but the second was inconclusive when matching Joseph Laboukan's DNA. But he was not ruled out. An anal swab was also performed and indicated two male DNA samples. Michael Briscoe's DNA was not found and it was concluded 100% he was not the inconclusive sample, but the same couldn't be said for Joseph Laboukan. Five people would end up being rounded up after the police investigations led them to the Windmill Motor Inn in West Edmonton, as well as West Edmonton Mall Zellers, a downtown lawyer's office, and the Fantasyland Hotel, which is also in West Edmonton Mall. I'll get into more on this when I talk about each of the accused. An Edmonton area broadcaster and newsman were also charged with violating provincial child welfare legislation in connection with the Court of Pat case. Gareth Hampshire and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation were charged with unlawfully publishing information serving to identify Cordopat and her guardians or siblings. Edmonton police laid the charges under the Child, Youth and Family Enforcement Act. Police alleged the violations took place on May 10th on CBC's Radio 1 network. A court date was set for December 20th, 2005, according to the last link on the left where I found this information. On May 24th, court dates were set for all five charged in the court of pad death, which would all end up changing. These cases became a matrix of hearings, and I will not get into too much detail with the court cases as they are just too complex, with numerous appeals being heard, upheld decisions, reversals. There was also a voir dire hearing, which is essentially a trial within a trial. Labukan and Briscoe were tried together while the youths were all tried in youth court, but Pyro and Stephanie would eventually be retried as adults. A lot of times, I'll try and add as much detail about the court cases as I can, but in this case, it was just too much. It became extremely dry, and this episode would be three hours long. If this is your cup of tea, details can be checked out at the last link on the left. You can also check out court records at canley.org with two eyes. A very common theme in these cases was everyone involved had their own self-serving sequence of events that they would tell. Pyro, Briscoe, and Laboukan all turned on each other during court proceedings, and Laboukan even threatened he would have Pyro and his brother killed, even from behind a prison cell. All these hearings also happened at different times throughout many years, so I will summarize and highlight something for each of the monsters. There are five different stories from each of the accused, which can all be read in detail on the last link on the left, using Wayback Machine, as this website has been archived. I'm now going to talk about the accused in no particular order. The first was Stephanie Bird, 17-year-old female. The youth's initial court documents referred to her as Cindy until her name was released after being tried as an adult. She was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome and attention deficit disorder, suffering from depression, and frequently gave herself self-inflicted cuts to the arms. She would also later be implemented in another crime that we will talk about later. At the time of the murder, she was shacked up with a 36-year-old man, if you want to call him a man, Michael Briscoe, who was the driver that night. Together, they were living at the motel in West Edmonton called the Windmill and was a frequent hangout for, quote, mall rats. Stephanie and Briscoe had just met earlier, days or possibly a week before, at the Humpty's restaurant near West Edmonton Mall. 
another typical hangout for these self-proclaimed mall rats. A woman convicted of her role in murdering Nina Kordopat sentenced to life in prison today. One month ago, the Supreme Court overturned a manslaughter conviction for Stephanie Bird, upgrading it to first-degree murder. Now, Briar Stewart's been following this story and joins us now. Briar? Well, David, Stephanie Bird is just 22 years old, but today she learned she's facing life in prison for her role in Nina Kordopat's vicious murder. She struck Kordopat with a wrench, but at first was only convicted of manslaughter. The judge believes she had a change of heart and left before the action killing. She could have been out on day parole this August. But last month, the Supreme Court disagreed and upgraded her conviction to first-degree murder. Today, the judge said Bird has made a lot of progress in jail. Now, Bird could be eligible for parole in five years. She's already served five years at an Aboriginal alternative jail in Saskatchewan. The judge is recommending that she serves the rest of her time there. Next, we talk about Michael Williams, 17 at the time of the murder was also known as Pyro and Buffy's boyfriend. He was a youth, but tried as an adult. Pyro was a thin, highly intellectual looking young man with spectacles who seemed to be well-spoken, which came to a surprise to many. This seemed to be an act to win the courtroom over. Obviously, it didn't work as everyone saw through his lies. He pleaded guilty to first degree murder and Justice Janice Franklin said, The crime was so horrendous and evil that she had no choice but to sentence Michael Williams as an adult. He would be sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 10 years. Pyro appealed, but the sentence was upheld. During his time in court, he pathologically lied and couldn't say the same story twice. He became so unreliable and would eventually admit everything he had been saying was a lie. After the killing witnesses say, He was wandering the mall in a zombie-like state with blood-soaked clothes. There was no excuse for this behavior, but it makes sense as his upbringing was so disturbing. He started drinking at age 11 and had a scary collection of knives. In one instance, he threatened to kill a classmate. And at 12 years old, his mother gave him up to social services because he was so difficult and she was scared for her own life. For this, he holds a long-standing deep grudge and a disturbing hatred for his mother. He would set fires, including an apartment building that he lived in. By 15, he became a drug dealer and a mall rat who lived by the mall rat code. He lived many days in the mall creating havoc for patrons and store owners. He survived by dine and dashing and smoking meth so he wouldn't have to sleep. Pyro described how there were two groups of mall rats both were bound by the mall rat code. Everyone in the mall were pretty much family. They cared for one another, he said. Diagnosed as a psychopath and self-described pyromaniac at the age of 32, he would later self-identify as a female and was only taking hormones to maintain an erection, but he hadn't had any type of surgery to align with his beliefs. He actually ended up getting transferred to the Fraser Valley Institute for Women and would be accused of sexual assault on three inmates before being sent back to a male facility. Whether or not he was having sex with willing inmates is not known. I also want to just let you guys know I am by no means against any type of gender transition, sex reassignment, or any of the LGBTQ communities. I believe you should do what makes you happy and nobody should stop you. However, in this case, I find it hard to believe it's legitimate, given his intentions. As of 2020, he was waiting his return back to the women's facility, and as far as I know, he is still in a male facility in segregation. I'd like to talk about 16-year-old Buffy, who was DW in the court records. Her identity remains protected under the Youth Criminal Justice Act, and she was the youngest of the five convicted killers. She had sharpened teeth and was addicted to crystal meth. She was Pyro's girlfriend. After the murder, she bragged to numerous people at West Hampton Mall that she helped in the murder, including a McDonald's employee who she showed the newspaper articles to. She was arrested at West Hampton Mall by Zeller Security and turned over to police. She pleaded with mall security as the hair dye she stole was going to be used to hide her identity from the people after her. She was found with throwing knives around her neck, which still had Nina's blood on them. 
and witness accounts testified she tried cleaning them in a Zeller's bathroom. She ended up telling Edmonton police officers a self-serving story of events, but admitted to playing a part. After a long interview, she then told police that she was pregnant and she was sent to a shelter. I am not sure if this was true or not. Her trial date was set for May 1st, 2007. She ended up firing her lawyer and created more delays, insisting she could no longer continue with Gary Smith as her lawyer. She was quoted saying, I believe I do want to dismiss him and get a new lawyer. This would actually extend her custody time. Her lawyer would actually tell the court that she was not against spending extra time in prison. This was a little bit strange, but maybe she felt like she needed it. In 2009, Buffy was sentenced to four years in custody to be followed by another three years of supervised probation after being found guilty of first degree murder and aggravated sexual assault. She completed her sentence by 2017 after numerous breaches. On the last day of court, she thanked the judge and youth advocate workers for the second chances she'd been given and was proud of not breaching for an entire year. She would leave the courthouse for the very last time with her fiance hand in hand and not looking back. Next is Michael Briscoe, originally charged with first degree murder, kidnapping and aggravated sexual assault, was let off and dismissed in 2007. However, in 2012, the Crown successfully appealed on the basis of willful blindness and he ended up being found guilty and was given 25 years to life for the first degree murder. Unfortunately, the bugger got off on the sexual assault and kidnapping charges as they were stayed. Although Briscoe didn't sexually assault or kill the 13-year-old, he ought to know what was going to happen. He knew she was going to be murdered. Judge Yamuchi ruled, adding that Briscoe aided in the sexual assaults. On February 11, 2007, the Sun reported that a group of Calgarians planned to appear at the Briscoe Labocan trial as a part of their efforts to lobby the federal government to reinstate the death penalty. A spectator at the murder trial of Michael Briscoe leaped the barrier and attacked the accused killer before being taken down by Briscoe's lawyer and sheriffs. Briscoe was also beaten multiple times when in remand. He was beaten so badly he may have brain damage. Having been labeled as a guilty party in a child's murder and sexual assault case will get you beaten or killed in any Canadian jail. In fact, a cellmate may be obligated to kill you or he could be in danger for not doing it. Last but least, my choice for the sickest of the bunch was Joseph Wesley Laboucan, 21 at the time of the killing, nicknamed Snowman or referred to as Bodycast Joe. Born in Fairview, Alberta on July 25th, 1985, Laboucan would be one of five children in his family. He was more likely the ringleader, but denied any wrongdoing throughout the interviews and court proceedings. He even looked at Nina's parents in the eye and would say, I'm sorry for not saving her, but I didn't hurt her. His story was the only one not collaborated out of all of the accused and witnesses. His mother told court that Labakan was no kind of ringleader. Quote, Joe was a follower. He always has been, she said. They really tried to play the victim card and make out Labukan as the unintelligent guy who couldn't possibly orchestrate all of this. Labukan lived in Fort St. John's, BC and had allegedly broke his back in a car accident a year before and was in a body cast for quite some time before coming to Edmonton. Hence his name, Body Cast Joe. From the last link on the left, sources would also say Labukan told court he suffered from attention deficit disorder, is epileptic, and has grand mal seizures, and blackouts unless he is taking his prescribed medications. He said he has trouble processing information quickly and has a hard time focusing his mind, especially when under heavy stress. Labucan said he fled an abusive home in Fort St. John. At age 13, when his stepfather kicked him in the chest, sending him down a flight of stairs, he moved to Edmonton, lived on the streets for two years, taking drugs and eating, sleeping where he could. After being nearly fatally poisoned by contaminated crystal meth, he quit the streets and returned home. Labokan testified he melted his skin off 
on his left arm when he was electrocuted trying to steal copper wire. He also said he received various head injuries after being hit by a 2 by 2 He said he hadn't done drugs for more than a year before Neenan was killed, and he drove to Empton from Fort St. John with three of his friends the week before, April 2nd, to pick up an insurance check for his settlement. Labukan said he and his friends hung out for several days at various malls around town while waiting for the check. He admitted he was hostile in the beginning with interviewers because he had a problem with male authority, reflecting his childhood when his biological father and his first stepfather smacked him around. In the beginning with police, Labukan actually confessed but would later take it back, saying his mind wasn't clear and in certain words, what he said was taken out of context. In Labakan's initial confession, he would write, quote, This is Joseph Wesley Labukan writing a full and total confession to being there and taking part in the murder of Nina on last Saturday night at 2.30 a.m. at a golf course location somewhere outside of the city of Edmonton. However, I would like it to be on the record that it was not my idea and I did not finish it, nor did I rape her. I was out there though and I participated. He also told police that he blacked out. He also told police that he was a black belt in karate and used to be a debt collector for the Hells Angels and beat up a lot of people but he would never kill. From the remand center he told authorities that it was the two Michaels that were the leaders and said he didn't even know what was going to happen. He also phoned friends in Fort St. John the night of the murder and told them that he saw a girl get killed. These friends would end up testifying at his trial. Apparently Labokan was linked to the case originally when his identity was given to authorities after Buffy was arrested at the mall and had pointed him out as they left. Labokan was arrested later that day on unrelated warrants stemming from an alleged break and enter and a charge of mischief and failing to appear in court, but they had not pieced together the full murder yet. On April 6th, he was released from custody. Then on April 12th, Labakan was picked up again at the Fantasyland Hotel, where he had rented two rooms. And that's when he was charged with Nina's murder, sexual assault, and kidnapping. He ended up getting a life sentence without parole for 25 years. Strangely enough, there's another side to Joseph Labakan. Childhood friends, ex-girlfriends, and even pastors would say nothing but good things about Joseph. They portrayed him as the complete opposite person that we see in this story, so you never know what really lurks behind the eyes of any individual. This story would take a crazy twist. It was found out, years later, that Joseph Labokan, Stephanie Bird, and Michael Briscoe were actually involved in another murder of sex trade worker Ellie Mae Meyer, who was 33 years old and lived in Edmonton. DNA would link the case to the trio. Meyer was killed on April 1st, 2005, just days before Nina's killing. Her beaten body was found weeks later in a field northwest of Short Park by a farmer. One of her pinkies was missing. This pinky was the same pinky showed to KB by Joseph Labokan and Michael Briscoe at the Windmill Motel. Briscoe's ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Bird, or Cindy as she was called, had testified they picked up Ellie Meyer in Edmonton on 118th Avenue and drove her out to a remote location. Joseph Labukan had sex with her in the backseat of the car. Then Michael Briscoe and Labukan attacked Meyer. Judge Amucci accepted defense lawyer Charles Davidson's argument that Miss Bird was an unreliable witness. Though Briscoe was likely present at the murder, Judge Yamauchi ruled that he couldn't determine beyond a reasonable doubt that Briscoe knew she would be murdered when they took Meyer out of town. The same was not the case for Nina Cordepat. Two days later, he must have known that Nina was going to die because of this. There was quite a few people who were on Michael Briscoe's side, but this had to have silenced them. As far as Joseph Labukan, he was found guilty in both murders. His DNA was found on Meyer, which sealed his fate. In the summer of 2004, Ellie Mae Meyer was interviewed by a local newspaper in connection with the deaths of Rachel Quinney, 19, Monique Petre, 30, and Melissa Munch, 23. Meyer had actually known all three girls. Ironically, 
Meyer's body was found within just a few kilometers of where the other three girls were found, an area northeast of Sherwood Park. This really makes you wonder what's out there. Could Michael Briscoe and Joseph Labacan be serial killers? Absolutely. Nina's funeral was held over a two-day period. Prayer services were held on Wednesday, April 13, 2005 at 3 p.m. in Memory's funeral home. A celebration of Nina's life was held on Thursday, April 14, 2005 in St. Albert. In honor of Nina, Pisha founded the Nina's Dream Trust Fund. The fund provides scholarships for youth interested in the arts. Scholarships are available to both young men and young women, as Pisha believes there needs to be better recognition of the abuse and other harms experienced by boys. Through Nina's dream, Pisha hopes to encourage other young people to pursue their dreams. Sadly, Pisha, mother turned activist, who was on a crusade to change the legal system, passed away from colon cancer and complications from pneumonia. Rest in peace. Nina and Pisha. This concludes episode six. Nina, thanks for listening. Talk to you soon.